Hello and welcome to the second edition of China Speaker Series dedicated to uh, China's power and its abuse in Xinjiang. Uh, this event is organized by uh, Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at International Center for Defense and Security. Uh, uh, this is the second event uh, and uh, the all goal of this series is to raise awareness of uh, China related issues and also uh, share light or shed light to the uh, security or, or you know security threats that might uh, come or rise with uh, increased interaction with China be it the political or, or economic field. And uh, uh, I myself am Frank Juris uh, from Estonian Foreign Policy Institute. I'm a, a research fellow here uh, whose focus is mainly on uh, China, uh, Chinese foreign policy, uh, China-Russia relations, EU-China relations, and Estonia-China relations. Uh, today's topic, uh, we will focus on the current issues uh, relevant to the uh, situation uh, that uh, Uyghurs and uh, other Muslim minorities are living in Xinjiang. And uh, we try to approach the, pro uh, uh, the topic uh, from a broad perspective and giving insight to the background as well as, uh, as how uh, these uh, ethnic policies are, are in implemented uh, at the moment. So, uh, uh, to start with, uh, the Chinese Communist Party sees ethnic issues as, uh, as an existential, existential threat uh, to the integrity of the country, uh, which cannot be postponed uh, uh, limitlessly to the future. And for instance, there is quite steep difference between uh, violent acts by Muslim minorities uh, that are declared as acts of terrorism and similar violent acts uh, co uh, committed by Han counterparts that are not uh, framed as acts of terrorism. Uh, with today's discussion, we hope to share light uh, to, the, to this distinction uh, and also understand what are the reasons behind it. From ethnic policy based on cultural autonomy, uh, which to large extent was the dominant uh, approach towards uh, minorities uh, before Xi Jinping, uh, this, actu uh, this approach actually itself has been borrowed, borrowed by the Soviet Union, uh, which uh, gave uh, cultural uh, autonomy and special rights to minorities uh, importance, for instance, uh, minorities could apply for universities uh, with uh, with uh, ease uh, or with uh, more easy than the rest of the population. Also, they had some special conditions for family planning and language learning. But as we have seen during Xi Jinping era, this uh, uh, this cultural approach based on cultural autonomy has been replaced by uh, signification. Wave uh, that involves involuntary uh, involuntary indoctrination, language policy, and forced labor, uh, supported by state-led uh, both uh, state-led birth prevention strategy, which, which is paving way uh, to the uh, eradication of Uyghur culture. Uh, this panel discussion will shed light to the implementation of uh, second generation ethnic policies in Xinjiang, uh, both uh, um, implemented by local and foreign actors that uh, uh, knowingly or unknowingly participate uh, in the implementation of uh, the second generation ethnic policies. And it also tries to shed light on the impact of local population, both uh, Muslim minorities and dominant Han, Han Chinese. Uh, despite the vast amount of data that has uh, leaked over almost five years or even longer uh, about the uh, horrible conditions in uh, Xinjiang, the international community's response has been uh, slow uh, to react and uh, Re react to this uh, to this uh, uh, situation there. 
so this panel will also address the reasons uh, behind uh, muffled response with particular attention to Turkey uh, and also examples from other places. And hopefully we will also have time to uh, provide ideas and, and, and discuss uh, 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 today how to improve the conditions uh, that uh, Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities are uh, facing right now in China. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I will uh, give a short introduction or short, in short introduce all the panelists and uh, then we can already start um, and finish with the formalities. Uh, Dr. Shen Roberts is an associate professor uh, of international affairs uh, and the director of international development studies at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George, George Washington University. Uh, he is an anthropologist by training with over 30 years of uh, experience of uh, searching uh, Xinjiang and uh, Uyghur, Uyghur issues. And he's also the author of a book published uh, just recently or last year, September, The War on the Uyghurs, China Campaign Against Xinjiang's Muslims. Dr. Darren Byler is a postdoctoral fellow at the Center of Asian Studies at the University of Colorado, Boulder. Uh, Dr. Byler has provided expert testimony uh, on the Uyghur human rights violations before Canadian House of Commons and has uh, published uh, in academic German journals and appeared on media on several occasions, uh, providing insights on, on the situation of Uyghurs. And uh, as I understand, he is uh, finishing or working on a book called Terror Capitalism, Uyghur uh, Dispossession and Masculinity in a China City, uh, uh, which will also uh, soon be published. And the third panelist is uh, Dr. Andre Klimes, uh, who is a researcher at the Oriental Institute of Czech Academia Sciences. And he's an expert expert of contemporary uh, contemporary China, especially Xinjiang, Chinese politics, propaganda and ideology. And he has cooperated with the uh, International Committee of Red Cross, uh, Human uh, Rights Watch and Radio Asia, uh, Radio Free Asia. And uh, similarly to other scholars also published uh, in academic journals and appeared uh, in media to provide expert analysis of, uh, of these issues. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Dr. Uh, Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, try to uh, cover in 12 minutes um, a bunch of issues, but focusing primarily on this question of the relevance of a, uh, alleged, an alleged Uyghur terrorist threat uh, concerning what's happening. I generally um, talk about what's happening in the Uyghur region as cultural genocide in the name of counterterrorism. And that's to suggest that uh, really the motivations are more around cultural genocide and uh, uh, the, the question of counterterrorism is really more of a justification. Uh, when I use the term cultural genocide, I'm not trying to engage the contentious question that's being discussed uh, uh, in many quarters right now about whether what's happening qualifies as genocide by international conventions and law. Rather, I'm referring to something that's uh, a concept that's been um, popular in anthropology, particularly dealing um, with the fate of indigenous peoples facing settler colonialism. So a lot of a lot of what you're seeing happening to Uyghurs and in other indigenous Muslims in the in the Uyghur region are reminiscent of things that have happened to indigenous people elsewhere in the Americas, in Austral Asia, and so on. And the motivation is essentially the desire to settle this territory and develop it so it's indistinguishable from uh, elsewhere in China. And in that equation, the local population uh, is essentially viewed as an obstacle to this plan and the state feels it must uh, eliminate or marginalize and quarantine uh, that indigenous population. 
But why is this happening now? I think that's a, a complex question that has uh, lots of answers. Part of it is uh, a, you know, this is a long conflict between Uyghurs and modern, the modern Chinese state or states um, that has to do with issues of sovereignty uh, and governance over the area that Uyghurs consider their homeland. It's also likely impacted by Xi Jinping's authoritarian turn. As Frank mentioned, the, the understanding of the second generation uh, nationalities policy, a different way of looking at cultural difference in China. It's also likely Im impacted by the importance of this region economically, you know, whether that's in, in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative or just more generally in terms of China's um, aims of uh, expanding its economic influence globally. And I think in that context, the state views the local population as a threat to its overall plans. And uh, finally, it's important to talk about what the Chinese state uh, says about what it's doing. And its justifications uh, are often about modernization, poverty alleviation in the region. But whenever uh, it's faced with sharp criticism, it falls back on a common refrain that it's combating an existential terrorist threat fueled by extremist Islamic ideas that have infected the population. Um, so my research suggests that there's never been a substantial terrorist threat in the Uyghur homeland and that Islam is incredibly diverse in the region. It's very difficult to, you know, kind of uh, blanket it as an extremist form of Islam. Uh, however, my, my research also suggests that the global war on terror has been instrumental in facilitating the counterterrorism justification for the Chinese state's oppressive treatment of Uyghurs and others in, in the Uyghur region, and also in deflecting international criticism of its policies, which is an important point. Um, and so in many ways, while, while what we see, uh, if you look at the situation, a lot of people look at it as uh, what's happened since 2017, but I think it's worthwhile to go back even further to the beginning of the 2000s when you start getting this, this uh, narrative about a, an alleged Uyghur terrorist threat. Um, so a, a very quickly, a little bit about this, this narrative. Uh, the Chinese state has had released documents very, very quickly after 9-11 suggesting that it faced a terrorist threat from various Uyghur groups abroad who worked together as an amorphous network called the Eastern Turkestan Terrorist Forces. And that this, this um, network was funded by Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. And it essentially included almost all Uyghur diaspora organizations, including many human rights groups in Europe. Uh, and so initially people uh, did not, uh, you know, the international community did not really um, uh, take this claim seriously. But suddenly in the summer of 2002, the United States agrees to list one group mentioned in these documents, a group called the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement as a terrorist group. Um, and the U.S. also helps China get that uh, organization categorized as a terrorist group on the U.N. Uh, Security Council's consolidated list of terrorists. Um, no experts on Uyghur, uh, studying Uyghurs, including myself, had ever heard of this group when, when this information uh, came, uh, came out. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The, the group was allegedly active in Afghanistan. Um, and, and I would suggest that this threat um, was never really a threat at the time. Uh, and it was reified both by the Chinese state and by Western terrorism analysts who continued to produce a narrative about this group that saying it, while it was marginal in the global war on terror, it was still a terrorist threat. So in terms of my research, just quickly, um, the group, the, no group ever called itself the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement. Um, but the group that got uh, associated with this name uh, was essentially the vision of this person, Hassan Masum, who left China in 1997 uh, with the goal 
of establishing a, a movement for independence, a religiously inspired militant movement for independence in, in Afghan, you know, from Afghanistan um, into China. It was a small group, under-resourced, um, and there's no evidence that it ever had any support from Al-Qaeda. And there's some evidence that the Taliban held the group at, at check, uh, in check at China's behest. There's no evidence that it ever carried out any violence anywhere, uh, let alone um, any violence in the 1990s, as the Chinese state documents suggested that you know it was responsible for numerous attacks in the 1990s. Uh, the organization itself only really uh, established itself in Afghanistan in 1998, and um, it essentially uh, ends in 2003 when Hassan Masoom is killed by the Pakistan military. And it's important to note that a year before that, he calls into Radio Free Asia condemning the 9-11 attacks and asserting that his uh, group has no ties with Al-Qaeda. Um, now, complicating the situation is uh, you know, after the death of Hassan Massoum, we don't really hear much, if anything, about a Uyghur terrorist threat until 2008, the um, uh, Beijing Olympics. But then a, a different group calling itself the Turkestan Islamic Party, uh, which is uh, essentially a vision of this person, um, Abdul Haq, uh, starts appearing on the internet, uh, making videos threaten the Olympics. Um, and this group is uh, a little bit different in the sense that um, uh, it, there is evidence that this group has ties with Al-Qaeda. It's in Waziristan in Pakistan, which is where Al-Qaeda had kind of been pushed at this time. Um, it claims to be the legacy of the, the other group, um, but uh, there's no evidence that really there's a, a lot of connection between these two groups. And this group similarly is, is very small. It's probably a handful of Uyghurs uh, in the region. And um, they really do nothing, uh, really not a lot more than make videos threatening China. Um, they're probably uh, a group of people who are fighting with foreign fighters in Waziristan numbering, you know, six to seven people who uh, are given a video camera, particularly after um, they, they threaten the Olympics and, and make a lot of news. Um, and, and this group continues to make videos um, at threatening China and, and cheering on any violence that happens in China related to Uyghurs. Um, but there's no evidence that this group has any ability to carry out any violence in China or any sort of ties with Uyghurs on the ground in China. Um, this becomes further complicated uh, in around 2013 when you see uh, a group calling itself the Turkestan Islamic Party in Syria. Um, and this group uh, is virtually, this is the first time you see a group of Uyghurs, militant Uyghurs, that is significant in numbers. And uh, most of them are people who've been recruited uh, after the 2009 Urumqi riots in China uh, and the crackdown that followed those riots. A lot of Uyghurs left the region, fled the country, particularly rural uh, Uyghurs, who went on human trafficking um, networks through Southeast Asia trying to get to Turkey. A lot of them were diverted to Syria. Uh, um, in fact, uh, a lot of the people who ended up in Syria were essentially uh, refugees who did not find uh, much support in Turkey itself. And uh, this, this group remains one of the last groups in Idlib in Syria now. It has some links to Al Qaeda, but it's not clear uh, how strong those links are, um, and it seems to continue to make videos. So, so this, this, these, these different groups that have been around this whole time, although they really have no impact on events inside China, they've provided a very potent, I think, um, justification 
for China to use very violent means to repress its um, Uyghur population and, and kind of silence its political voice in any sense. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things I think that happens from this narrative from the very beginning is that, you know, you have increased state violence trying to weed out uh, terrorists within the Uyghur community in China. And that leads to, to some resistance, which leads to more repression. And uh, you get a cycle of violence between Uyghur civilians and Chinese law enforcement. Um, and all, uh, you know, all through this cycle of violence escalating, the Chinese government is continually calling this um, terrorism rather than contemplating any kind of legitimate grievances on, on which this resistance is based. Uh, and eventually this evolves, I would say, into the state viewing all Uyghurs as dangerous and potential terrorists and uh, extremists. Although I, I, I still maintain that I think the, the real motivation for that is about development and um, settlement in, in the Uyghur region. So just as a closing point, I'd wanna say, um, you, you see from the 1990s to the present, uh, the Chinese state first um, looking at Uyghur nationalism as something that is a threat in trying to counter that, uh, to countering um, Islam more broadly because the linkages between uh, terrorism and Islam in the minds of, of the, the Communist Party in China essentially starts targeting uh, religion itself as, a, as uh, an extremist ideology. And then finally to countering all Uyghurs. Um, and so that's some broad strokes about this issue. And uh, in the q and I'd be glad to uh, follow any threads in, in more detail for people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, for your insight and, uh, and also framing the Uyghur situation and, and the situation in Xinjiang and how the Chinese Communist Party tries to depict it to the outside world. And uh, as we can see from the uh, talk from Mr. Byler that uh, the great extent this, uh, this small uh, extremist groups uh, have been tried to dealt with, uh, with extreme force and, uh, and uh, widespread measures that uh, might seem like an overreaction uh, to, the, uh, to the actual situation. And, and like Mr. Roberts mentioned, the true reasons uh, between this kind of confrontation uh, between the Muslim minorities and and uh, Han uh, Han population might be uh, in different uh, fields of, uh, of uh, be it social inequality or or you know becoming the uh, not <laughs> becoming the minority in, for instance their own capital Urumqi. So without further ado, uh, please, Dr. Weiler, the floor is yours. Great, it's an honor to be here. Uh, let me share my screen here with you and I'll tell you a little bit about my work. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing a bit more on the economic drivers behind th this process that Sean has described. Um, mostly I'll be drawing on the first you know, introduction and first chapter of my book, uh, which will be out this fall called Terror Capitalism. Uh, which is based on the ethnographic fieldwork uh, over 24, 25 months in the capital city of the region, Urumqi. Um, I was there last in 2018. Um, and since I've, I've not been able to go back uh, to do further research, um, but I have been starting to do some research across the border in Kazakhstan. And I'll also be talking about some of the interviews I've done with people that just fled the region to Kazakhstan. Okay, to really understand the economics of, of the situation, we have to go back to the 1990s, which is when China was opening up to the West, was becoming a manufacturer for the world and really needed raw materials to drive their economy. The, the state was very specific in, in you know, trying to find energy independence, to find a resource as much as they could, products in their own state. Um, and Xinjiang, which is up in Northwest China, and it's around one sixth of the land mass of China, um, is a source of, of a great deal of those raw materials. 
So in the 90s, large numbers of Han people, the majority group in China, began to move into the Uyghur region. There had already been some Han people living in the north, uh, but in this period, they started to move into the southern part of the region, uh, down here, which is south of the Tian Shan Mountains. Um, and this is the historic homeland of the Uyghurs. You know, 95, 99% of the people that live there are Uyghur. Uh, most Uyghurs growing up in this space are villagers living in, you know, doing farming. And many of them did not meet Han people in their daily life until the 1990s or, or 2000s. Um, so when these uh, settler population arrived in the 90s, they began to build the hard infrastructure, the pipelines, the railways, um, all of the things that were necessary to extract the resources. 20% uh, of Chinese oil and natural gas comes from this region. Um, and over the span of the 90s and 2000s, uh, large sections of, of the oasis lands here were turned into industrial scale agriculture, into cotton farming and tomato farming. Uh, a lot of this uh, production was controlled by state-owned enterprises or state-managed companies. Um, and when it came to the resource sector, Uyghurs were pre pretty much excluded from those jobs. Uh, they did find some work as tenant farmers in the cotton production, mostly growing cotton, uh, but it wasn't as though they were making a, a lot of money in, in, in those sorts of jobs. And so really what, what happened in, in this period was the cost of living began to rise and Uyghurs were largely excluded from the new economy. And so they saw themselves becoming further impoverished in some ways, and they also saw themselves losing control over the basic institutions of their society, the, the financial system, the education system. Um, those now became really the domain of the settler population. It didn't happen immediately, but over those two decades, um, it, they were really kind of captured. And, and that's an element of colonial capture um, that, that Sean was mentioning. In 2010, uh, a new development arrived, which was uh, 3G networks, which linked up Uyghurs with each other and with the broader Muslim world. Um, and this really uh, had, uh, had a major effect on Uyghur organization as a society. Many young Uyghurs were buying smartphones when I did my first year of field work. Um, they were getting onto a, an app called WeChat, which is a social media app. Um, and this allowed them to organize themselves when they migrated, because many people were starting to move from rural areas to the urban centers, and then from there to the city, looking for work. Uh, and the reason why it was mostly young men is because that's that was the, the population that was sent out by their families to provide for their families back in, in, in the villages. Um, they used WeChat to find jobs and to make connections in the city, um, but they also used it to uh, discuss politics and to discuss Islam. WeChat allows people to use an oral speech function. Uh, and, and for Uyghurs, that means that they could speak freely uh, on this app because the state really couldn't control what they were saying if they were using oral speech. Uh, they didn't have the tech technology to assess what they were saying. So it sort of hacked the censorship system. I don't know if Uyghurs necessarily knew that, uh, but it did seem like it was a kind of public private space where they could talk more freely. Uh, there was a lot of religious oppression. You know, Sean has mentioned this already. And so people saw the mosque space as, as the space where they did the ritual practice of Islam, but they said real Islam was happening on their smartphones. That's where they could talk about, you know, what Muslims in other places were doing. They were interested in piety movements. Um, mostly very normative forms of Islam. Uh, you know, what is halal? What is haram? How should we dress? These sorts of things. Not necessarily questions about political Islam or political struggle. Um, there may have been a small percentage of people that were interested in those things, but in general, that wasn't the conversation. I was in a, a, a number of the WeChat groups where they talked about these things at, at that time. In 2014, this began to change. Um, this was when the state declared the, the People's War on Terror in response to several uh, violent incidents that had happened outside of the Uyghur region and in, in Kunming and in Beijing, which are these two cities in eastern China. Um, the incident in Kunming involved a, a group of Uyghurs carrying knives and, and killing people, over 30 people in this train station, and they were really attacking Han civilians. Um, so this was one of the one of the few incidents that really kind of met the definitions of, of terrorism as is defined in most places. Um, like Sean said, many events, protests and against police brutality were also characterized as terrorism, but in fact don't really meet that standard. 
so the Kunming incident was called the China's 9-11 and they, they declared the people's war on terror and began a de-extremification campaign. They didn't only target those that carried out crimes um, or supported them. Instead, they began to target the entire population. They began to conflate piety, you know, religious practice with, uh, with, violent, with violence and political violence. Um, even though there really was no evidence to, to show that. Uh, along with the, the, begin, the new controls on, on, on behavior, uh, the poster I was just showing you is saying you can no longer have a beard or, or veil yourself uh, or have Islamic symbols. In addition to that, they also began to control the internet. Uh, so they worked in private public partnership with many corporations um, for, that are you know, at the leading edge of Chinese technology development. Uh, there's now 1400 firms in the region and their goal is to sort of break the autonomy of the Uyghur internet. Um, a few of the tools that they've developed are tools to automate the transcription, translation and assessment of Uyghur speech. Uh, so remember they are using WeChat to communicate, talk about politics or Islam. That's now uh, something that the state can, can censor. Uh, they also develop tools to uh, detect people's faces as they moved into spaces, kind of automating forms of racial or ethnic profiling. Um, and I'll talk about this third example in a, in a second, which is this device. It's a, a counterterrorism sword um, that's used to assess someone's digital activity. Uh, they, you simply plug it into your phone or your computer and it will scan through your digital history looking for around 50 to 70,000 different markers of, of flag materials, of political or religious materials. Um, it's basically working in the same way that virus scan software would work. Um, but in this case, the viruses are Islamic thinking or Islamic thought or anything to do with Uyghur culture. Um, and uh, these devices in particular were really instrumental in determining who should be sent to the camps. Uh, from interviews I've done with former uh, state officials or people that were working in the policing system at the time, they said that when you had scanned someone's device, uh, you would be given a reading of the person's past history um, that would be coded red, orange, or yellow, uh, or green. And, and um, if it was red, it was the things that I've highlighted here in yellow that would, would show up and, and the others could also show up in, at times. Uh, but it was things like this person had been part of a WeChat group. They had used a VPN, which is a virtual private network to get across the censorship system. They had downloaded WhatsApp, um, listened to unauthorized teachings on their phone, uh, or they had images of people that, that uh, looked Muslim those sorts of things, uh, contacts with people in Muslim majority countries that also showed up. Uh, so you can see that it's really mapping the social network and, and just sort of normal behavior, things that were not criminalized in the past, but had now been criminalized and then punishing them after the fact. If people were determined to be untrustworthy, they were then sent to a camp. Um, often there was interrogation that happened in, in that beginning stage where they might, they might actually determine they should be sent to prison instead of the camp. Uh, but many were sent to the camp. There was uh, over 300 that were built or adapted during this time. Um, and at the height of, of internment, probably as many as one and a half million people were held. The camps are not schools or training centers as the state sometimes talks about them. If we look at the government bid contracts, it's very clear that these are medium security prisons, that the, the guards carry non-lethal weapons, uh, that the, the people are under surveillance at all times, that they're behind locked doors. I've interviewed around 15 former detainees at this point, um, and all of them have said from, you know, they were in camps across the region that this was a carceral space. In mid-2018, the state started to build factories in association with the camps. Um, so here is the, the actual camp enclosure, and then here are the factory spaces and dormitories. Um, as you can see, they're just adjacent to them. Uh, many of the people that are working in, in the factories are working in the garment industry. Uh, this is, like I said, the source of 84% of Chinese cotton, um, or I, maybe I didn't say, but it's in that map I showed you earlier. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense that you would want to produce the garments in the same space that the cotton is grown. The state says that it wants to move 1 million textile jobs to this region, uh, which means that uh, if they are successful, that one in 11 textile jobs will be located in, in in Xinjiang. 
Part of what's driving this is the rising cost of labor in Eastern China. Already some jobs are leaving China to go to places like Vietnam or Bangladesh, um, but now they can out, outsource or offshore labor to a space that's inside China, to this group of people that is incarcerated and is unfree um, and can be given very low wages or, or un, be unpaid. One of the people that was forced to work in a factory after her internment was this woman. Her name is Gulzira Al Khan. Uh, I interviewed her uh, in January of last year. She was found guilty of watching Turkish TV shows, of uh, traveling to Kazakhstan, of having a passport, of being under the age of 55. And so she was determined to be untrustworthy. Uh, she was held in a camp for about a year, released for two days or three days, and then was uh, assigned to work in a factory that was seven kilometers from the camp she had been held previous. When she arrived in the camp or in the factory space, uh, she recognized her new boss, which was this man, Wang Xinghua, uh, who had actually visited the camp where she had been held before and had selected her as a worker. She had seen him several times in the camp. Um, and I'm pointing that out to show that there's a direct linkage between the camp and the factory. Uh, here he's talking in a state interview uh, about the factory, saying that they've hired or given jobs to over around 2000 Kazakh and Uyghur workers as part of a job creation program, a poverty alleviation program. Uh, so they're really benefiting the Uyghurs and Kazakhs. Um, and he's also saying that the, the, the factory has generated $6 million in sales in 2018. Uh, what he doesn't say in the interview is that he was paying Gulzira only 300 yuan or $50 per month and then one and a half pennies per pair of gloves that she made, uh, which is around a sixth of a minimum wage. It's really just a, a kind of an allowance to buy something at the company store. It's not a, a, an actual salary. Um, he justified wage garnishment uh, based on the fact that they were housing and uh, feeding Gulzira and the other workers and also providing transportation back to her village once a week. Um, and, you know, they have no way to protest. Guzira said, you know, they made us sign the contracts or we would be sent back to the camp. But that was, it was very clear. Um, and she, could, she also told me, you can see that this was a kind of slave labor because of the way that they were treated and, and how they were, were unpaid. So what does this case suggest? Uh, well, what's going on here is a, a kind of original accumulation, a sort of frontier building of capitalism um, and, a, and colonialism at the same time. So initially there was a drive to get access to the oil and natural gas and, and then cotton from the region. And now they're really you know, wanting to capture Uyghur and Kazakh labor. Um, you should see this as, a, as part of an ongoing process of finding you know, the cheapest labor for the most product um, that's happening in many places, has happened all over the world and it's continuing here. Um, it's also, of course, extending state power at the same time. So what my book really argues is that what's happening here is, a, is a, the production of a new sequence of, of, of racialization where the, the terrorist body uh, begins to function as an, as an other, a, a racialized other uh, that's marked as Muslim and ethnic and therefore can be exploited because they've, they've now entered into a sort of state of exception, um, which means that they're civil rights and human rights no longer apply. They can really be treated with impunity by the racial majority and the state. Um, and it's producing two interlinked modes of, of capital accumulation or production. The first really has to do with data harvesting and, and building the intellectual property of the new technologies. This is something that China is championing as, as, a, as the future of the Chinese economy is, is building new technologies and then exporting them elsewhere. The other thing that's happening here, of course, is the coerced labor. Uh, so you have this, this, this labor force that can be put to work. Uh, together, all of this produces a system of unfreedom and really a destruction of a people, which is the, the basic definition of crimes against humanity and, and genocide. Uh, so it's a, it's a very slow genocide in the sense that they want to make these people productive rather than mass killing, uh, but it is producing uh, the destruction of, of their ethnicity uh, as it was before. All right, so I'll, I'll leave it there and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Tyron, for an extremely interesting uh, introduction to the issue. And I'm sure we have uh, many questions that we'll address uh, later in the question and answer section. So I already encourage the listeners to post their questions there. So we'll have a stop when we start with the question and answers. And uh, thank you again for, you know, building upon Dr. Roberts's uh, uh, explanation of how 
how the initial idea was the colonization was to have access to the natural resources and how now it has developed from mining of oil and gas to mining of data and that can be used for uh, for the benefit of uh, also uh, big tech companies that try to go abroad and sell their services abroad so this is definitely something to pay attention to uh, also in the future but uh, without further ado let's uh, give the floor to uh, Dr. Dimes thank you Yes. Uh, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Thank you uh, for the invitation. I am sorry, I don't have a presentation prepared, but I will be talking a lot about uh, a recent article of mine, which was published recently, so I can share the link and also some related links if anyone is interested to read uh, the research I'll be partially referring to. Uh, I will start by getting back to what Sean, Sean Roberts has said before, that uh, the alleged uh, terrorism or separatism has never been uh, a major security threat to the stability of the, of the regime in China, contrary to what's being said by the official version or by the official narrative. I think uh, the case of Xinjiang policy uh, generating a very negative uh, reaction in uh, the international community, such as the ongoing uh, debate declarations of the policies as genocidal or uh, the multiple uh, bans on um, products produced by uh, companies linked to these forced labor schemes in Xinjiang, which have been placed to some on Xinjiang entities recently. I think this is really a case uh, or, or a sign of how uh, China's own policies in Xinjiang are in fact becoming very detrimental to its political interests abroad. And that means also domestically. That means the highly extreme radical policies of recent years, which uh, however are culmination of a several decades long process have become a political liability for the Chinese regime uh, from, from abroad. Um, I have been working recently on, um, on how China tries to contain the negative effects of the crisis uh, uh, in Xinjiang or of the, of the um, uh, radical extreme policies uh, that uh, the negative effects, effects that the policy has been generating or ne negative impact, negative impression, uh, reputational damage uh, um, uh, in other countries. China has been uh, uh, forced to devote enormous amount of resources to contain the negative effects by, um, by performing a lot of uh, propaganda work, united front work, uh, and other activities throughout the world. I have been looking in greater detail in uh, such activities of Chinese organs in uh, Turkey. Uh, Turkey is a country which uh, how, hosts uh, several tens of thousands strong uh, community of Uyghurs, which have been coming to Turkey in several waves in uh, larger numbers, particularly after 2000. Uh, nine, after the um, suppression of the protests in, in Urumqi, and also uh, in, uh, um, but uh, in recent years, the inflow of Uyghur, of Uyghur, um, of Uyghur refugees to Turkey has been, has been very limited by the restrictions placed on travel from Turkey. So, uh, there are a lot of Uyghurs living in Turkey, several, some est estimates range from 35,000 to uh, 50,000. It would be good to know some uh, official numbers. Uh, they are, the U Uyghurs in Turkey are a very lively diaspora, very politically active. They have been enjoying Turkey's relatively free political climate, which means they can uh, engage in uh, publication, political activism, demonstrations, uh, lobbying uh, with uh, Turkish political actors, uh, some uh, <clears throat> communal activities uh, such as uh, private schools, etc. So 
a uh, lot of information about what's going on inside Xinjiang has been actually coming from the Turkey, from the Uyghur diaspora living in Turkey. Uh, also given uh, or due to the situation, given to the ongoing destruction of Uyghur uh, culture and uh, um, identity in the sense of a nation with own history, uh, language, religious practices, cultural practices. So given that all these features are being systematically uh, destroyed in Xinjiang, as Darren has pointed out, uh, Turkey is uh, one of the key uh, spaces where Uyghurs can freely engage in the preservation of their, of their survival of their own identity. So that means they can publish books in Uyghur, uh, they can uh, speak Uyghur freely, they can uh, use uh, signs in Uyghur language uh, on their shops outside and uh, many other things they cannot do in their homeland anymore. They can uh, use their own East Turkestan flag, which of course is completely illegal in, in Xinjiang and other features which are impossible in Xinjiang. So from these several aspects, the Turkey, the situation of Uyghurs in Turkey is in many ways really fundamental to the survival of Uyghur nation as a large community of freely existing people. Uh, therefore, uh, the activities of the Uyghur diaspora in Turkey have been causing a lot of problems to the Chinese Communist Party because they have been able to, uh, to refute the official narrative of what's going on. Uh, in Xinjiang, uh, the narrative is, has been refuted many times, partially by information uh, <clears throat> uh, coming from, from Uyghurs in Turkey. Uh, so uh, China has been engaged in very complex efforts to uh, um, cope with the, with the Xinjiang problem in Turkey. The Chinese actors have been uh, performing very wide, uh, complex range of activities which I've been looking into. I have identified uh, the engagement of uh, multiple uh, party state organs, both from the party high party bureaucracy, state bureaucracy, um, uh, very wide ranging and deeply penetrating uh, range of, of activities. Uh, um, for example, the latest appointment of new ambassador Liu Xiaoping uh, in last fall to the position of China's ambassador to Ankara, to Turkey. Uh, based in Ankara is very interesting because it shows that uh, China perceives its, uh, in its relations with uh, Turkey uh, predominantly um, as a security issue because Liu Xiaoping previously headed the Chinese Foreign Ministry External Security Affairs Department. Uh, China has been perf performing firstly very complex uh, psychological operations to pressure, to put pressure on Uyghur diaspora. So it means by uh, means of uh, directly calling them uh, from either from Xinjiang or Chinese, uh, Chinese actors have been contacting them uh, from other countries also. Uh, in Uyghur informants have reported being visited uh, personally in Turkey by individuals acting on behalf of uh, China's security forces, trying to pressure them either into supplying specific information or into spying on a permanent basis on uh, their uh, fellow exiles in Turkey. Uh, uh, try or pressuring them to refrain from, uh, for example, taking part in uh, demonstrations against China, etc. So the pressures of uh, Chinese organs on Uyghurs in Turkey are very wide ranging. Um, uh, there's also a, a range of legal warfare or legal measures which China has been trying to trying to institute. Uh, I think one a recent case in the legal sphere which uh, sh deserves close attention is uh, the future debate about the ratification of the extradition treaty which uh, Turkey has concluded with China 
in uh, May 2017, and which has been ratified uh, just uh, months ago uh, in December 2020 by uh, China's uh, National People's Congress. So it will be important to watch whether this treaty will also be ratified by uh, Turkish uh, National Assembly. Uh, China has been, of course, performing complex propaganda in Turkish language by its own actors, such as uh, the Ankara Embassy, Istanbul Consulate websites, uh, China Radio International, uh, China Xinjiang.cn website, relatively newly established. They all run their Turkish language versions, which are able to cover uh, all major aspects of uh, of uh, the the frictionous uh, topics in in the in uh, the the China in the Xinjiang in discussion of the Xinjiang situation with the international community, um, United Front work uh, performed by China's actors targets, for example, uh, Turkish actors, of course. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the China Council for Promotion of Peaceful National Reunification, which is a, uh, an entity identified last year as a foreign agent of the People's Republic of China by the US administration. Uh, this, uh, the local branch in Turkey has been uh, doing donations to, to, to local Turkish politicians, for example, donation made to uh, Akram Imamoglu, the mayor of Istanbul at the end of Ramadan in 2019, which was widely publicized in uh, China's media. Uh, and it was uh, specifically emphasized that the donation was made at the occasion uh, of the end of Ramadan, which I found very interesting that the Chinese embassy is actually uh, mm, adopting uh, adopting uh, a major uh, Islamic religious festival as a, as a venue for, for public diplomacy. Uh, whereas in Xinjiang proper, uh, celebrating Ramadan is, would constitute grounds for uh, long-term uh, political re-education or uh, long-term imprisonment, sentence and in imprisonment in regular prison. So I found that very interesting. I, I've been able to identify several other cases, uh, several other similar cases of this adaptation to local, local cultural practices. Uh, China's United Front work also targets the Uyghur business diaspora who is interested in uh, business exchange between Xinjiang and Turkey. They also, the, the activities also target Uyghur students which live in Turkey. They also target local actors such as uh, political parties, for instance, the Patriotic Party, a long term ally, uh, supportive of China's uh, policies in Xinjiang, regularly declaring Uyghurs uh, separatists and terrorists in their media. Um, United Front activities performed by local actors the particular the patriotic party have been able to involve major uh, businessmen in Turkey, such as Murat Ülker, who had done significant amount of his previous business in Xinjiang, or uh, Bekir Okan, for example, who, uh, by the way, is the founder of one of the private uh, Okan universities, which houses one of the uh, Confucius institutes operated by China in Turkey. Uh, and other channels. Uh, so the scope of activities China is performing in Turkey to contain the negative effects is quite uh, wide. And besides uh, providing a specific case study, I think it also gives a general overview of uh, how complex uh, are the ways uh, China seeks to eliminate the uh, negative impact and uh, the negative repercussions of its own policies in Xinjiang, which have undoubtedly caused uh, serious negative impact on uh, the uh, own political interests of the Chinese Communist Party in recent years. Thank you.
Thank you, Andre, for uh, giving a very good uh, insight of uh, Chinese attempts to control the narrative in regard of Uyghurs uh, living in Turkey. And uh, very interesting to hear that how over time also you could sense the sophistication of Chinese soft power as, as, as the made, uh, made the donation at the end of Ramadan. Very interesting, you pointed out that something similar, even you know, practicing Ramadan is totally forbidden in, uh, in Xinjiang and could lead to, uh, lead to being sent to the re-education camp. And also how the soft power is in a way uh, supported by the sharp power. Uh, and uh, these battles of uh, soft and sharp power, I understand uh, we can see the outcome very soon already. Uh, Andre, can you say when, when will it go to uh, Turkey's assembly and when, when it's supposed to be ratified, uh, just as an additional fact? Uh, you, sorry, you're muted. Excuse me. Um, Oh, uh, last time I checked, uh, uh, the treaty was still to be ratified and was at the uh, committee, still uh, at the recent, uh, at, at the Turkish National Assembly. But I have to admit, I haven't checked in recent uh, several mm -hmm. weeks, let's say, because uh, the finalization of the articles before publications was quite lengthy. So the last update is really several weeks old when the treaty was still uh, after it was ratified in December in Beijing, it was still at the respective committee of the Turkish National Assembly. Thank you. And uh, I encourage the listeners to ask questions uh, and I can see there are already a uh, few first here, uh, but uh, as a moderator, I, I will lose my chance to... <laughs> get something uh, that's been on my uh, mind for a long time now. And, and this goes for all the panelists, uh, uh, as this project, uh, China Speaker Series, also is also about capacity building. And, and I'm sure we have many academics listening to this uh, interesting and fascinating panel. Uh, it would be very interesting to know how has the access to this region, uh, the Xinjiang region, impacted your personal research on the subject matter and uh, how do you feel, how has it impacted the, the field, field you're studying yourself? Uh, and also, as Andre was just uh, recently talking about narrative and control of narrative, then uh, this has also, this you know, limited access had also given CCP uh, possibility to question, to question the sources and the facts coming from, from the region. Uh, and, uh, how how would you how would you explain uh, to the people who uh, are not everyday uh, you know doing the research and uh, fighting with this uh, limited access issues and and uh, please uh, all of your comments maybe we start with uh, Mr. Byler. Sure, uh, that's a great question. So th there's a number of different ways we can continue to re research. It is very difficult to go there now. Uh, I was there last in 2018 and, and during that trip, I didn't contact people that I knew, uh, even if I was in the same neighborhood as them uh, over the phone or in any other way, because I, I was worried about them being implicated by talking to me. Uh, so it meant I could really only do sort of observational research. I really couldn't interview anyone. And the same is true for journalists. It's, it's very difficult to speak to people directly because of the cost it will, it will give them if they're found out. So in order to have any conversations, I would do it in a taxi or through a kind of, I would go to the persons that I knew the, to their place of business and and speak very quickly with them um, in kind of the course of a business transaction, you know, buying something in their store or that sort of thing. But you can't do a sustained interviews. So that means that I've instead begun to do work across the border in Kazakhstan, where there's around a thousand or so people that have come across the border just in the last, you know, 12 to 24 months and can really speak with a, a real depth of knowledge about the systems that, that they've gone through, if they've been in the camps or even outside the camps, the sorts of surveillance systems that are in place. Some of these people are, are former government employees who can speak to the systems workings from inside of it. And that's really a, a very key resource uh, for you know, kind of beginning the inquiry. Then the, the other thing that we've been working with a lot as, as academics is government documents. Uh, 
there are people within the Chinese government who are quite opposed to what's happening there and are leaking documents. Uh, recently, I've been working with uh, a, a journal called The Intercept, um, which, you know, that's what their work is, is, is getting documents, leaked documents. Um, and we have uh, we received around 58 no, 52 gigabytes of internal police documents from the Urumqi Police Department that have thousands and thousands of Uyghur names uh, with their ID numbers, uh, their geolocations, uh, talking about how and why they were detained um, and really giving us a very clear picture of how the surveillance systems work, how what the goals of the, the program were. Um, there's other documents that have come out as well, um, and all of these things help to, to corroborate the story. Then, of course, on top of this, we also have satellite imagery, where we can see these things being built in real time. We can match that to the government bid contracts, because to build the camps, they actually paid you know, private contractors to build them, and you can find those documents online. The specifications that were asked for are, are there. Um, all of this gives us a lot of granular detail. It's still not the same as direct observation, but there's ways of triangulating and, and really making the case very clear that this is what's happening. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Roberts, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would just add, I mean, um, I think that, uh, I mean, I've been doing research actually outside of China for quite some time because uh, some of my earlier publications uh, created problems with the Chinese state. Um, and so I, I'm, I actually, even in the 1990s, I found when I was in Xinjiang at that time, uh, I had the same experience that Darren's talking about where I couldn't actually do sustained interviews with people or it was just too dangerous. Um, but at that time, there was a, a, a kind of robust back and forth across the Kazakhstan border. And I, I did all of my interviews in Kazakhstan with different people. Um, but one point I think that's important that Darren brings up uh, is so one of the things I've noted recently is that all of the information we're getting from inside the region is actually um, government or official media reports. Um, and this creates a problem for me because my languages are Uyghur and Russian. So um, I'm not doing any research on the, these materials, but uh, Darren and some of our other colleagues have been doing a really great job at, at mining this stuff. And so on the one hand, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, very much the state's view, but it, it, collab you know, it, it corroborates everything that we've been seeing uh, for the last several years because um, these are actual government documents and government mouthpieces giving the information about what's happening. Um, you know, so some of the local news sources on the internet um, are, are giving pretty, uh, pretty detailed explanation of what's happening in the region. Um, and, you know, and, and I, I imagine it can only be worse than the information we're getting um, because uh, that information, it goes through a filter of, of what the state wants to, um, wants to report. Thank you. Uh, Andre, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, I can only uh, agree. Um, I also had uh, problems uh, in Xinjiang with, with, I mean, I had problems in Xinjiang with, with security organs already a long time ago. So uh, I've been working from outside the People's Republic for quite some time as well, uh, doing uh, work Firstly, working with open sources, secondarily working with informants uh, outside China, both uh, Chinese, uh, Han or Uyghur nationalities. I can only stress again that it's really important now for all countries to really take good care of their uh, Uyghur, Tibetan, Han, uh, in political immigrant communities uh, due to the situation uh, in, in their homelands. Because, uh, uh, I mean, basically all Uyghurs living abroad or perhaps Tibet, even all Tibetans, we, I think we can extend that, are basically political refugees. 
because all their nation is now under politically motivated uh, motivated uh, attack aim of this i mean uh, goal of destruction so they should be considered political refugees it is really important to uh, protect them from pressures of chinese security organs abroad and enable their safety to ensure their safety so that they are not afraid to speak out and to uh, reveal what's going on inside Xinjiang and other places in China. Thank you, Andre. Uh, just a quick question to follow too is that uh, I heard many cases of uh, countries uh, questioning their extradition cooperation or extradition law with China over Hong Kong people, but uh, has some, something similar taken place in regard of uh, the Uyghur minorities? Okay. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, all the Uyghur diaspora, for example, getting back now to the discussion of the extradition uh, treaty with Turkey, I would like to reiterate that uh, the Uyghur diaspora in Turkey is very worried about the potential repercussions the treaty could have on their lives, because some of the passages of the treaty are given... Uh, are uh, raising their fears about, uh, po about the fact that their extradition to China might be made easier by, by this treaty. Extradition for political reasons. Uh, um, because both, um, I think China, what's been, what's been uh, said by uh, the previous uh, presentations, China obviously have, has a very specific definition of what terrorism and crime is, which is not necessarily the same as the definition in other countries throughout the world. Yeah, and, Thank you. and I'll just add to that. I think uh, this is another point where the terrorism issue becomes really important. Um, I know that uh, I've been contacted by some people working on refugee issues in Europe who've been very concerned that um, even though their country may uh, not want to extradite Uyghurs generally, that um, the, there may be people who fall through the cracks through regulations in those countries about terrorists. And so if the Chinese government says, we want you to extradite this person because we have evidence that they're terrorists, um, that can make... Um, you know, bureaucracies can allow that to happen, I think, inadvertently. And it's a, it's a, real, it's a real danger right now. Thank uh, you. Uh, sorry, yeah, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, the extradition treaty signed by China and Turkey, I have it in front of me, set, for example, contains clause which says, for the purpose of extradition, it shall not matter whether the laws of both parties place the offense within the same category or describe the offense by the same terminology. So, I mean, I'm not a legal expert, but uh, mm. yes, it's, it, the, the risk of what uh, Sean just mentioned, I think, it exists. I'll just add something really quickly, if I can. Uh, so, you know, if you look at the 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 Chinese state media around the Uyghur students that were extradited from Egypt back to China back in 2017. Like it says very clearly that they were placed on the Interpol list, or at least some of them were, that they, were a, they were a, had a red flag on the Interpol list and that's how they, their, their extradition was justified. When there's really no evidence that they were part of any sort of terrorist organization, they were just there studying in Egypt. Um, so that's like what Sean was saying, we have to be very skeptical, I think, of, of how international organizations can be used in this way. And the most recent, I think, example of, of Uyghurs being extradited for terrorism related issues was from Indonesia, uh, with two Uyghurs being sent back um, just in the last several months. Uh, in general, though, I think most countries now are, are have, at least in, in Europe and in North America, have, have stopped those sorts of extradition. Um, and they've actually, in some cases, actually made some formal regulations around that, in, like in Germany and Sweden. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's that hopefully the direction that this is headed. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. I have a question now from the audience, and I think this is not uh, or directed to uh, Dr. Roberts. Why isn't the framing of PRC actions in Xinjiang as colonialism accepted more widely? It's in the quoted in the chat. Yeah, um, that's a, that's a good question. I I think what's interesting is um, when I started writing uh, my recently published book, um, you know, I tried to make a case. For, for that point. Um, and it had been generally kind of, um, uh, I guess, skated around by academics. They, they tried to avoid using that discourse previously. But what I've noticed is, you know, even as my book was getting published, that was already starting to shift. Um, and uh, I think among academics now, uh, that's that's much more of an accepted understanding, and and part of that, you know, goes to something that's also happening globally with uh, understandings of colonialism. That there was a strong kind of, I, I think, tendency in academic studies of colonialism until very recently to view colonialism only as European domination of non-European countries, you know, during the era of European empires. But, uh, you know, the discourse on indigenous people's rights has has uh, played some part in changing that. And I think just academic um, trends have also changed that perspective because they're seeing more and more people looking at uh, lots of empires around the world that have colonized various locations. So, um, Thank you. Uh, next question from the audience, uh, and I think this is more suitable for the provider. What is the situation of the Uyghurs who are sent to other parts of China to work at factories? Are they able to move around in the city? Do they get paid? Are they able to practice religion? Do they bring families with them? Uh, that's a great question. So there's really two main tracks in the sort of assigned or unfree labor system in Xinjiang. Uh, there's the people that have been in the camps and then are assigned to factories that are associated with the camps. Um, and that's one track. And most of those people stay inside Xinjiang. Um, then there is also an, a second track of what they call surplus laborers. And these are often uh, the family members of detainees that are still back in their villages, or sometimes they're not even related to anyone who's in the camps, uh, but they are farmers typically, and therefore seen as unemployed. Um, and so because of that, they're deemed surplus and the villages and towns and, and other jurisdictions have been given quotas, at least in some cases, to find, create jobs for these people. Um, so because there's these benchmarks that are that the state has put in place for a number, the numbers of people that should be proletarianized, should be made workers uh, in a formal sense. And so those folks are often the ones that are sent to other parts of China. Um, it says in the government documents that they, they do this voluntarily, but it's also quite clear that resisting job placements or what they call poverty alleviation is also a sign of extremism. So people understand that there's a, an a implicit threat there that they can be sent to the camps if they refuse. So really the way that you could refuse is if you have some sort of health issue or some other family thing that you can, you can say you have a, a, get an excuse, but in general, you're assigned to go. Um, they typically go as a single person. And when they arrive in uh, the location where their factory is, is located in Eastern China, they are organized in a military fashion. That's how the state documents talk about it. They are controlled by local authorities from their home village back in, in Xinjiang, they come with them. Uh, there's you know, guards as well in some cases, and they're not permitted to travel freely in those spaces. Uh, they're not allowed to go back to their home village without permission. Um, typically they are gone for you know, months and months at a time, a year at a time often. Um, and so they're quite isolated and there's a lot of restrictions on what they can do in that factory space and dormitory, the dormitory and factories are in the same compound. They are not permitted to practice Islam. Uh, they are instructed to speak Chinese. That's part of the process as well as to, to learn political uh, ideology and also Chinese. So it's, it's actually part of the re-education system. Uh, it's not as restrictive or as 
damaging as being in the camp. Uh, I think that's probably that, that's fair to say, uh, but it is still a kind of forced labor. And what I'm seeing in the interviews I've done with people that have gone through this or, or, or been involved in it is that there's often forms of wage garnishment that happen. So even if they're given, you know, the minimum wage, oftentimes a good por portion of that salary is taken from them. Um, it, it, the contract is not with the employee, but with the government officials who have assigned them to work in that factory. And so there's many opportunities for state officials to take money out of, out of the, the money that's actually supposed to go to the worker. Um, so all of this is to create, creates a kind of unfreedom um, and makes this a kind of forced labor, even if um, there is some ways that they're being paid because there's restrictions in movement, because they cannot say no to the work, um, it, is, it, it's the, it creates the dynamic where they really have no choice but to work. Um, so it's, it, the other thing that, that is actually in all of this is that it's creating family separation that's endemic throughout Uyghur and Kazakh society at this point with the parents being gone from the children, the children are being sent to residential boarding schools. So we should see this as part of the colonial system as well. Um, where they're trying to stop the social reproduction of, of these groups. Um, and we see that in the way that the, the birth rates have fallen in a really dramatic way among, among Uyghurs and Kazakhs. And if I can just uh, add to Darren's points, um, one of the things I think that uh, a lot of Darren's work has, has shown very clearly is that anything that happens out of uh, kind of penal institutions such as the the internment camps or actual prisons, uh, anything is is almost coerced. Uh, and I think it's the combination of the mass surveillance and the threat of being put in a penal institution essentially means that um, anything that the Chinese state presents as uh, happy Uyghurs or Kazakhs who are in, you know, um, agreeing to state policies, um, you can't really take that as free will because of uh, the context that they're, they're in. Thank you. Just to follow up quickly, there is also a question about uh, how perfect is the system of digital surveillance in Xinjiang? And uh, to add up to there also, are there any legal grounds? Because uh, some of the information that this, uh, for instance, this uh, IJOP gathers like electric, electricity consumption. This is not even illegal according to the Chinese laws. So this privacy uh, privacy issue, as I understand, this uh, you know is a very big issue uh, also for the Xinjiang people there living there. And, and and another question to build up on that one is also how does it affect the community? As I understand, uh, this convenience police uh, corner corner street convenience police stations. They have actually employed a lot of local uh, population. So, how does it impact the um, Uyghur religious inside the Uyghur community living in Xinjiang? And uh, also, this mass surveillance, how is it uh, impacting also the Han population there? As I understand, they are also eager to leave. <laughs> leave Xinjiang because uh, you know no 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 nobody uh, in clear mind would like this massive massive surveillance and data collection so uh, maybe uh, andre first for you sorry i can't hear you I'm muted i think uh, i think he's saying uh that he doesn't necessarily have the information on that. No, um, no, I would leave the floor uh, to to others to the two other speakers. I think that's more proper. Yeah, and I, and I would um, I would pass the surveillance question to to Darren, who's done a lot of research on this. Sure, I can start. Uh, so the in 2017 and 18, the state hired around <clears throat> 90,000 uh, new uh, police officers. Uh, these were assistant police. Uh, they were given a 15-day training. Uh, many of them are Uyghur and Kazakh, um, and most many of them are men, young men. Um, I, my sense from interviewing people that were in that force and my observations when I was there in 2018 is that they were many of them were joined the police as a way of protecting themselves from being sent to the camps. 
Um, and, you know, by having government affiliation, there's some protection. Um, and, you know, even though they are Uyghur and Kazakh, they, the, the people that are giving them orders are, are Han and their policing is done in Chinese. Part of like, a qualifying as a police officer was to speak Chinese. Um, and so there's a, in, in some ways, their ethnicity actually makes them harsher in terms of how they treat others because they know themselves that if they show any sort of weakness, they can also be sent to the camp. They're in a very precarious position. And I think lots of Uyghurs and Kazakhs understand that. In terms of how the, the, the surveillance works, um, it's very comprehensive. It's probably the most tightly surveilled space in the world. Um, and the police presence is also the, it has the most density. It's really at the space of the East Germany before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, so imagine the Stasi having all of the equipment that the Xinjiang police have, which is, you know, tools to surveil people's digital activity, to track their GPS movement, you know, as they move through space, they have these fixed checkpoints where they go through um, on a regular basis, maybe 10 times per day. Uh, they also are uh, tracking their uh, social relations, uh, which means that people are quite isolated in how they talk to each other. Everyone knows that anyone could be detained at any time. And so they just sort of, you know, stop talking about issues. Many people I talked to very briefly while I was there in, in 2018, you know, they knew about the camps and like they knew about their family situation, but they didn't know what was happening in other places. So they were like asking me for information about the camps in Urumqi when I was in Kashgar, that sort of thing. Uh, so there's a lot of isolation that comes out of this surveillance system. Um, it, it's, I mean, the other way you can think about this is, you know, if you have a smartphone and you carry it with you on a regular basis, it's tracking your movement. It knows more about you than your own parents might. Um, so if the government has that access to that knowledge and can weaponize it against you, um, then it becomes quite intimate. It moves from, you know, surveilling public space to the family, to actually your thoughts themselves. Um, and not to get too dystopian about it, but, you know, it, it really is at that level. Uh, where all communication is now really filtered through the system. Or in the other way, it, it, people feel as though it could be censoring them, it could be watching them, and so they censor themselves even more. So there's a, a kind of panoptic effect where you start to discipline yourself even more. It's a very uh, pervasive, violent system, even though it's not physically violent, and you know, people being killed, um, it, it's it really damaging psychologically uh, for many people. That's that when I talk to people as they come across the border, that's that's one of the things that they mentioned first as as the thing that they were running away from. And and I'll just add, you know, it may be useful for um, the the audience in Estonia. I op I often think of um, the the participation of Uyghurs and Kazakhs in this uh, in the same light as like the Stalinist purges of the 30s. I, I spoke to somebody who had been living in Xinjiang uh, during throughout the first year of, of uh, what was happening. And that person told me, you know, that the, the things that that person told me were very similar to things I heard from people talking about the Stalinist purges, you know, just fearing uh, saying anything um, to anybody that might be construed as problematic that could, uh, you know, basically end up with you being categorized as, you know, in the Soviet case, an enemy of the people, in the Xinjiang case, an extremist or a terrorist. And, um, you know, obviously it's, it's easy to kind of look at that situation and say, you know, there's people within the population who are supporting their own people's uh, repression, but it's difficult unless you're put in that situation to know, you know, what, what one would do because uh, you have this constant threat hanging over you. I mean, the person told me uh, they would wait every night uh, to, for a potential knock on the door um, that they might be taken away. Yes, Andre, please. Yeah, maybe just a quick follow up. I think uh, uh, working with Uyghurs uh, both in Xinjiang and in diaspora for about uh, 20 years 
I'm sure all three speakers can agree that um, um, the, the Chinese policy is uh, producing a tremendous uh, pressure and is inflicting tremendous psychological damage onto the whole uh, nation for, for several generations now. Thank you. And uh, there's we are limited time, only six minutes left of the of the event. And uh, just to end with a more positive note, uh, uh, what could be done, or, or what uh, what could you know what could be done in order to improve the conditions of uh, Uyghurs, uh, either living in Xinjiang or or living in diaspora. And uh, it's just building up from a question on the audience that uh, what are what steps are you expecting from the Biden administration and also what could the uh, EU do and EU member states, uh, even small uh, nations like Estonia uh, to, you know, show light to this, uh, you know, the issue or somebody, can, or people have even said uh, the genocide, genocide of the 21st century. Uh, you know, in Europe, we have witnessed already one, and this one was already too too many. And uh, just for you know, for for Europeans or the West to be taken seriously in, in value-based foreign policy, this this uh, this demands not only expressing concern but uh, but uh, actions in order in order to you know stop the crimes against humanity. Uh, I can I can start with a quick impression on that. I mean, I think that my, my feeling is that the most, uh, the most impactful actions are going to be uh, economic oriented. Um, I also think those are going to be the most difficult ones for states to take because, um, you know, it, it hurts both uh, the Chinese government and uh, the government taking the actions because of the way that the global economy is so intertwined now. Um, but I think this is, this is critical. In the U.S. right now, there's a, a bill in Congress that passed the House of Representatives called the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act uh, that essentially bans any uh, products coming into the U.S. that have Uyghur forced labor in their supply chain. Um, that has not been yet uh, approved by the Senate. And I, I, I'm a little bit concerned that it may be watered down in the Senate because there's major corporations like Apple and Nike that are lobbying against it because they know that they probably have this problem. They probably have a Uyghur forced labor in their supply chains. Uh, and I, so I think that that, um, I think that kind of action is likely going to be the most powerful um, because I'm hoping that that could, uh, it, it could bring a, a, the Chinese elite um, to the, sa the same conclusion as Andre made earlier, that this is not actually in China's best interests and that um, they, they're gonna have to uh, really reevaluate re what they're doing. I could just add a, a few things really quickly. One of the most positive stories or you know, things that I've seen happening recently is talking to people, Han people inside China, who, you know, their initial response to what's happening is there in, and reporting from it is that it's not true, that it's exaggerated, that it's uh, you know made up by the CIA just to stop China from becoming great again or, or whatever. Uh, but as they began to read more and more of these stories and as they continued to come out and as government documents surfaced, um, all of the evidence began to pile up, they you know, eventually said, we have to really take this seriously, it must be true. And then they actually started to ask their own questions in people that they knew that had gone to Xinjiang. And, and so you know, they said like, you know, I thought I would never change my mind on this issue, but I have changed my mind. Um, and they were hopeful that others would change as well. And that's really important because I think if this is going to stop, it will have to come from inside China. Um, mm -hmm. And so really you know, building uh, awareness around this issue by keeping it in the spotlight is important. Uh, one of the things that people are pushing on is to relocate the Olympics in 2022, which are scheduled to be in Beijing. And you know, the, the, 
the importance of that is, is not just to punish China or to introduce a moral cost, but also to communicate to the general public in China that the world is taking this issue very seriously and that they should as well. Um, I think, you know, it's, there's a gap in knowledge still in China because the media is so tightly controlled by the government. And so we shouldn't give up on the general public in China. Um, the other thing we need to do is build coalitions uh, around this issue. It shouldn't only be the US or Europe, you know, the powerful nations in, in Western Europe standing up because they have the privilege to do so. Everyone should be working together on this. And, and so I think there should be other nations ri rising to the fore and taking leadership. Uh, I know it, it will t take, there's a political cost and economic cost in doing that, but I think it's, it's important and, and really what needs to happen next. Andre, you have something to add? Uh, yes, just just quickly, um, I've been uh, I've been uh, happy that uh, the um, the question of how how to uh, how to deal with China due to what it's uh, doing in Xinjiang has been also appearing more in in. Um, in the European debates, for example, European Union announced just in past days that it's about to sanction uh, several high-ranking officials, uh, Chinese officials in connection with the, with the rights violations in Xinjiang, an intense debate about labeling the, the actions in Xinjiang as genocide have, has been going on in the UK. The Dutch parliament recently passed a resolution where it does declare the policy a genocide. So I've been seeing uh, after several years that the debate really has been shifting from, from media to policymaking circles. I agree that uh, it, the, the economic measures will be uh, tough to take because they, uh, they necessitate a substantial reevaluation of how we do business throughout the world. What is, what is clean product? What does it mean? So it's a, it's a good it's a it's a long term debate, but uh, I think economic measures are, have the highest potential to make China uh, change its policies. There, uh, I would also again add uh, that it's important now in this event to support also Uyghur initiatives, both uh, inside and inside China, if possible. So it means to increase uh, um, number of scholarships for Uyghur students, support, support Uyghur media or uh, other forms of knowledge production, uh, cultural preservation and similar activities. Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting panel and very good uh, insights for the future. How uh, we can um, cooperate and build alliances to help the Uyghurs who are suffering either, either inside of China or outside or, or being afraid of being extradited uh, and uh, so on. So thank you all uh, for all the panelists for participating and giving their expertise uh, analysis on the subject matter and thank you all uh, for listening and uh, for your extremely thoughtful questions. And uh, please tune in to our future events. We have two more events planned uh, on this China Speaker series. And uh, I hope to uh, see you back soon. Bye bye.